the police! With 26 million homes in the UK, we are living on top of each other. And he was just here. They want this land so bad it hurts them. And when neighbours go to war... Are you threatening me? He was just totally out of his head. Why don't you come and hit me? It can turn home life into a living hell. It's horrible living here. You feel like a prisoner in your own house. I just felt that there was no way out of here. And it's totally wrecked my life. Coming up... Welcome to my cannabis cafe. A nuisance neighbour brings drugs and chaos to his estate. The police just came to arrest Jonathan, I think. What he's doing is illegal. One new neighbour causes havoc in his local community. His famous words were, I can do as I like, when I like, because I'm a millionaire. He was screaming. I could not believe the lunacy of the man. And there's a killer on the loose. He said that he was going to kill us. We suddenly saw a knife come through the door, being waved about with a slashing motion. In the heart of leafy Surrey, one man's alternative lifestyle... Cannabis helps you sleep and eases the mind. Ask any good raster. ..has left him at odds with his neighbours. He's obnoxious, annoying, pain in the arse, really. Caused chaos in the community. I noticed seven men banging on the main flat door. And sent him on a collision course with the law. What did you take him for? Some sort of criminal? Forty-year-old security guard John Lidicott has lived on the edge of historic Guildford in a quiet housing estate for 15 years. I seem to get on well with most of my neighbours. I keep myself to myself. I have my son stay half terms, and he likes to come and stay with me here, play football. Yeah, it's quite a nice area. But one year after moving in, John got a new neighbour when Jonathan Falcus moved into the flat directly below. This, this is a nice council estate. Quite green, it's far enough out of the town to discourage the complete idiots from dropping in. It wasn't long before John Lidicott met his new neighbour for the first time. I'd taken a couple of days off to do some decorating. I was in here painting the wall at the time. And then all of a sudden I heard all this um, shouting and swearing going on from outside. And I thought, you know, what the hell's going on out there? So um, I went to have a look what was going on. I looked out this window here. Jonathan was outside with his guy, they were arguing and shouting. Jonathan was blinding at this bloke in his face and um, shouting, get out of my flat. And uh, there was all clothes all thrown all over the area. And I thought Jonathan was going to hit him. According to Jonathan, the man he was arguing with was his flatmate at the time. I was staying with us for a year. A Polish ex-army man went a bit berserk on us and drilled us like a drill sergeant. For three hours, he barracked us, blinding, which we didn't appreciate much, and neither did the neighbours. So I had to throw him out. John Lidicott then got a surprise visit. There was a knock on the door. Jonathan was there. He was, seemed all casual. He apologised for the noise, and um, he said, um, but I'm your neighbour, Jonathan, we haven't really met. Um, do you fancy coming down for a drink and we can get to know each other a bit better? But um, I declined his offer. Jonathan Falcus had certainly started to make an impression on his new neighbourhood. I got this place as a result of being homeless and penniless for a while. It's a one-bedroom flat. It's very nice to have, however, it's not what I was brought up with. I was brought up in the Victorian wing of a Georgian mansion in Seal. We had open-top touring cars, au pairs, and three of us started at prep school until my family ran out of money. I got dumped into grammar school, which was great. I did no further work, whatever. <laughs> However Jonathan was brought up, he was here to stay. The two men stayed out of each other's way, but a few months later, their paths crossed again. As I was going into my flat, one of my neighbours from over there came out and she said, um, while I was away, Jonathan had smashed my window. And I thought, God, you know, what's he done that for? So I was really angry. When I got to the top of the stairs, 
I could see that this window here had been um, smashed. I went into my flat and the first thing I saw that my dog had been sick everywhere, um, where it was frightened. I thought Jonathan has done this. By this time I was really pissed off with him and wanted to confront him. John went to confront Jonathan, but he wasn't home. At this point, I did feel really wound up with Jonathan, and if he would have been in, I probably would have punched him. John called the police. There's no actual proof it was Jonathan, but uh, the police said, we can't prove it's Jonathan, but we are 99.9% .9 sure it was him. At the time, Jonathan denied anything to do with it. Yes, I did break John Lillikant's window. He's admitted it. Oh, I'm quite surprised he has admitted it. I've been listening to his dog barking all day long for months. The dog obviously wants to be let out. John wouldn't uh, let me walk the dog. So I went to the door, assessed the situation, and kicked this panel in. Let the dog out. The dog came out, stopped barking, and had a lovely time running around the neighborhood for a while until somebody brought it back to him. Well, it's only a pane of glass, it's easily mended. What's more important is how you look after your dog. Possibly my dog was barking, but I think that's just an excuse Jonathan's used to break into my flat. Council probably mended the glass room free of charge. What's the cost of him? <laughs> All or nothing, isn't it? Dickhead. For the next few years, the two men had a frosty relationship, but all was calm on the estate. But what Jonathan did next would wreak havoc, not just for John Lidicutt, but the entire community. Jonathan's constantly slamming his door, and the people that Jonathan has around are really dirty, they're smelly. Some of them are drunk, some of them are drug addicts. It's just people running about you know, over night time, smashed, and they are smashed. Coming up, Jonathan's antics make his neighbours go potty. I came back from a night out and there was one here, one over there, and then two next to Jonathan's door. Four middle-aged men completely high off the head on the ground. I was like, oh my God. New residents move into a picturesque country village and cause havoc. She came across to the fence and said, what are you going to do with him, you man? And one man's surprise visit. It was banging and kicking and shouting and swearing. At that point, I didn't know what to think. In rural South Wales, the peace of a small, friendly village was shattered by the arrival of new neighbours. I realised they weren't nice people when I saw the notice. Trespassers will be prosecuted and beaten up. Foul-mouthed bullies. When Anna Radcliffe moved into her three-bedroomed house in South Wales, it seemed the perfect place to bring up her two sons. This is the back garden. It's really nice, really quiet. You can hear the river. You do see lots of different wildlife, lots of birds. And it's just a really nice place to come and chill out. Over the next 10 years, Anna's family became part of a peaceful community. The building at the end of their back garden was the friendly local pub. The property used to be a pub called The New Inn. It was really lovely and they had tables outside and they used to have sort of hanging baskets with flowers and it was all kept really nicely. So, and there was a play area for the children as well, so it was really nice. On the other side of the pub, Anna's neighbour was 74-year-old David Jenkins, who had lived there for 53 years. It's a very friendly pub. We used to go there regular Saturday, Sunday, where there was a little place, little area for dancing, and uh, we really enjoyed ourselves there. In 2012, the pub closed and was sold to a family who wanted to make it their home. The newcomers immediately began renovating, and alarm bells began to ring for their neighbours. 
I realized they weren't nice people when I saw the notice in the car park. Trespassers will be prosecuted and beaten up. And that triggered my mind to think, what sort of people are these they want to beat you up if you're trespassing? Yet to meet her new neighbours, Anna was out in her garden when their paths crossed. The first time I met Mr Swain, I was walking this way um, to go in through the back door. So as I was coming round, he sort of came at the fence and he was just, just all like this, hands and arms everywhere, swearing and being really aggressive and just waving his arms around like this constantly. And he was just really, really angry. He said, get your vehicles off my land. And he just kept repeating it, screaming it over and over again. The family caravans were parked at the end of Anna's garden in the off-road parking space that belonged to her property. It was quite intimidating. He was really nasty, very aggressive. And I called the police and someone went round to have a word with him. A few days after the police visit to her neighbours, Anna received a letter from a solicitor acting on behalf of the Swains. Well, I came home and my partner had already read the letter and I looked at it and I was just could not believe what they were saying. We understand that you have parked a caravan so that it obstructs our client's access to his property, which is not true, and that despite our client having asked you to remove the offending items, you have refused to do so. And if the items are not removed by 9 o'clock on Wednesday the 20th of March, um, our client will be left with little alternative but to take further action. I was really annoyed, really, really annoyed, because the caravans are parked on our land. Anna says she offered to take her title deeds to the Swain solicitors, showing that the land was in fact hers. But she just got more letters insisting she move the caravans. We would get letter after letter and it was quite stressful. You never really knew what you were going to come home to. And it was really, really an unpleasant time. Uh, my father was very ill at the time and he was dying and I had that to cope with. And it was just, it was just too much. On the other side of the pub, pensioner David Jenkins was about to meet his neighbours for the first time. The first time I spoke to Mr Swain, our Mrs Swain, was the day that I complained they were burning what I would regard as toxic waste in the garden. The smoke was billowing out, black, acrid smoke. I went down to her there, shouted across, put that bloody fire out, and she came across to the fence and said, What's he going to do with you, you oh man? David says the fire brigade were called and they asked the Swains to put out the fire. But that evening, when Mr Jenkins' 22-year-old grandson was at the house, Mr Swain paid a visit and, according to Mr Jenkins, he wasn't asking to borrow a cup of sugar. He just said, come on, and he said, let's go for a spin in the car so we can sort this out. And I said, no, we're not coming with you in the car. We're not going to degrade ourselves. So he said to Reese, my grandson, you come then, he said. And have you got any brothers and sisters you want me to beat up as well? His famous words were, I can do as I like, when I like, because I'm a millionaire. And nobody will argue with me, because my other job is a cage fighter. Having lived in York for several years, in February 2015, single dad Steve Foster moved back to his native Lincolnshire for a fresh start. As soon as I viewed this flat, and I thought it was perfect. Right area, you know, there's a shop just behind me there. You know, town's quite nearby, and the rooms inside seem really nice and big. I uh, moved into the top floor, um, I think it was okay, I think it was perfect. A few days after moving in, Steve bumped into one of his new neighbors. So I first met the guy um, who lived downstairs when I was topping up the electron here, just in the alleyway there. It was just a nod of the head, like nod, nod back, no words or anything or exchange like that. Steve's neighbour below was 26-year-old Raimondos Jackstas from Lithuania. He seemed like a nice guy, a quiet guy, kept himself to himself generally. He seemed like a normal guy. Unfortunately for Steve, Mr Jackstas didn't keep quiet for long. 
a matter of days, the noise started to build up. It started with like, um, like just generally like chatting and laughing and joking. Then the music started, and then you know, quite loud techno bass, and it was coming till all hours of the night. So I'd be walking through the flat and I'd be able to hear the bass myself. I'd be able to feel it through the floor, actually, like physically on the bottom of my foot. It wasn't just Steve who was affected by the noisy neighbours. It was keeping us on awake till quite late at night. Some nights it'd be like going on till like two in the morning. If having my son stay over and so like he hasn't got a very good night's sleep and you know, it just, it just ruins the whole day. Steve had been in his flat for less than a month, but was already beginning to lose patience with Mr. Jackstas. And what happened next caught him completely off guard. I came back from work one day and I found a letter at the door and it was from the council stating that they'd had multiple complaints, that they'd heard loud music and sort of like shouting and, you know, just general loud noises till like silly o'clock. As soon as I read the letter, yeah, I felt, I felt a bit confused. You know, it's nothing to do with me. Steve knew the real source of the noise was the flat below. So he took the letter of complaint downstairs to Mr Jackstas. Well, I went up to him, I was like, well, look, here's a letter, here's what's going on, and here's what's been said. And he seemed to sort of like take notice, but I don't know if he was actually paying any attention at all. They weren't friendly at all, they were still the quite sort of like solemn faced. Worried by his neighbour's attitude, Steve decided to forward the council's letter to his landlord. After I gave the letter to the landlords, um, you know, I thought that'd be it. I thought there'd be no more noise. I thought that'd be the problem dealt with. But Steve's problems were only just beginning. Three weeks after confronting his neighbour, he was putting his son to bed when he heard a commotion in the back garden. I went to the kitchen window to investigate where the noise was coming from and right, what was happening. And um, that's when I saw the guy from the flat downstairs. He was banging and kicking and shouting and swearing and just generally just banging about. Um, shout out, it's like, can you keep it down, mate, please? Because my son's in bed and it's quite late. Just keep the noise down. But Mr Jackstas didn't take kindly to being told what to do. He was saying, like, I kill you, I kill you, I kill you and your dog. I'll giant you, like, just basically threatening us with, like, violence and that it was going to hurt us. It sounded really sort of like there was some sort of intent in his voice. Or well, as I looked down, I could see that he was, um, he was trying to climb up the drain pipe and trying to climb up onto the flat roof. He couldn't manage it because he was drunk. But then he decided to get a table and climb on that. At that point, I thought, well, he's, he's actually trying to get into the flat. I was, well, maybe he's serious about his intentions. I was concerned for everybody's safety, primarily like my son. Then I told him that I'd ring the police and that's when he backed off, that's when he went away. I thought that was it, that was the end of the situation. I didn't think anything else was gonna come at it. But this was about to turn into a night he'd never forget. You could see the silhouette downstairs kicking and banging the door, like trying really hard to get into the house. Everybody wants good neighbours. Good afternoon. But you don't always get what you want. In Guildford, John Lidicott's happy home had come under threat when Jonathan Falcus moved in downstairs. Jonathan's making my life a misery. He just feels that he can do what he wants. Everyone's pissed off with Jonathan. I think John is selfish and thinks the world should revolve around him. Wanker. After four years of peace, John's problems with his neighbour were suddenly reignited in explosive fashion. I was sitting in this chair watching the TV. All of a sudden, I heard a load of banging, smashing, noises coming from downstairs. It sounded like a load of stuff was getting broken. I thought, God, you know, what the hell is going on down there now? So I, um, I got up and I went down to Jonathan's flat to see what was going on. So I walked up to the windows. I noticed this one here was slightly ajar. So I pulled the window open. I looked inside. I saw one of Jonathan's friends and I said, what's all the noise? And he said, oh, Jonathan has um, totally smashed his own flat up. I, I couldn't believe he'd done it to his own flat. Baffled by the situation, John went straight back to his flat to call the police. 
At this stage, I thought Jonathan was acting quite dangerously, really, you know, to smash his own flat up. He was starting to act sort of quite violent. The police spoke to Jonathan about the incident, but decided not to pursue a criminal case. I mean, if you smash somebody else's flat up, which I have done, then that's a criminal offence. But smashing up your own place is just averagely stupid. It's not a criminal, I wouldn't have said. Jonathan's erratic behaviour was affecting all of his neighbours. In September 2014, he got new neighbours when 19-year-old Rhea Mitchell and her dog Razor moved in next door. The community seemed really nice. Uh, everyone in the flat's really friendly and welcoming. Um, I get on well with all the neighbours except Jonathan. He just has no respect for his neighbours. He is so disruptive and he just doesn't care at all about anyone else but himself. Shortly after moving in, Rhea started to notice that her new neighbour's lifestyle was a little different to her own. I heard these really loud bangings um, outside the flat. I was really freaked out and I didn't know where it was coming from, so I looked out the window and I noticed seven men banging on the main flat door. They were saying, Jonathan, open the door, we're out here, Jonathan. One had a Stafford Chibble Terrier. It was really aggressive, it was barking and growling. And then I went to bed because I didn't want to get involved. Over the next six months, Rhea says the number of visitors to Jonathan's flat steadily increased and residents all over the block were growing suspicious of why it suddenly seemed so popular. There was a really strong smell of cannabis coming from Jonathan's flat, and I thought, God, they must have people in there using a the place just to smoke cannabis or something before something dodgy is going on here. I came back from a night out, it was about two o'clock in the morning, and I noticed that there was four middle-aged men completely high off the head on the ground. There was one here, one over there, and then two next to Jonathan's door. Um, I was a bit shocked as it was pitch black, so I turned on the light and I said, why are you here? And they were so high off the head, I just got no answer, so I went back into my flat and was like, oh my god. <laughs> All the neighbours were feeling uneasy, especially John whose young son would often come to visit. I haven't wanted my son come and stay with me because it's drink and drugs, and I don't want my son seeing any part of that, really. John was going to confront Jonathan about the smell of cannabis, but before he could, Jonathan was already the talk of the neighbourhood. One of my neighbours told me about Jonathan was opening a cannabis cafe. Coming up, the police come knocking. The police just came to arrest Jonathan, I think. Anna's very own slice of heaven turns to hell. He was swearing that'll stop your view of the river, and he was screaming. And in Lincolnshire, Steve discovers the true identity of his neighbour. I'm still shocked that a convicted murderer was living right below us when I was just up there, and it's really shocking. You live next door to each other and exchange a daily hello. But do you really know what goes on behind closed doors? One of my neighbours told me about Jonathan was opening a cannabis cafe. In Guildford, Jonathan Falkus has enraged his neighbours for years with loud music, aggression and general mayhem. Now, word on the street was Jonathan was also into drugs. Welcome to my cannabis cafe. Follow me. Well, we have a selection of soft drinks and alcohol. Teas, coffees, squash, wine, brandy, lager. So there are people here with cannabis. They'd pass the joints around and everyone would get a bit of a smoke. We have a bong. We could put a mix in the bong and pass that around everybody. Get everybody staying quite cheaply. Comfortable place to come and uh, smoke cannabis and socialise with like-minded people. No, it's not a cafe. It really, it's just a, it's a dos house. It's somewhere where people can get drunk, get stoned. It's attracting a lot of 
strange people um, and I shouldn't really have it rammed down my throat. I was really shocked when I first heard about the Cannabis Cafe. I was a bit like, is this really happening? I think this Cannabis Cafe is pathetic. I think it's ridiculous. There's a lot of vulnerable elderly people down here and it's scary. What he's doing is illegal. But Jonathan's so-called cafe offers more than just tea, coffee and good times. Well, really, we're looking for people to pay at least £10 if they're staying the night. I sleep on this large sofa at night. Can sleep on these. These are perfectly comfortable. And there's a couple of bedrooms back that way, double beds. Well, I think we have had two people on that sofa. These are really individual sofas. I just think it's pathetic that he can describe a one-bedroom flat as a hotel. For John, living directly above meant he was never far from the party. I come home from work, I got straight into bed. And within about 15 or 20 minutes, they're putting the music on. So I was feeling really pissed off about this. I tried to get to sleep for about, I don't know, maybe two hours. So I came downstairs, I was really angry with Jonathan, I was really pissed off with the noise, so I came up to this window, I, um, I pulled the window open, uh, I said to Jonathan, Jonathan, you and your mates have just kept me awake again, I've just done a night shift, I've had no sleep, it's seven o'clock in the morning, you've been playing your music. And he did apologise to me, but I thought he was actually just taking the piss out of me. I don't think we played particularly loud music, we play nice melodic music, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, R Rihanna. Well, I think Taylor Swift is a sensational artist. Uh, you know, anybody would enjoy listening to her music. John Lidicott reported Jonathan to the council. The council warned him that he was in breach of his tenancy agreement, and if he continued trying to run an illegal business from home, he would be evicted. When the council told me that I had to stop running the Cannabis Cafe, I asserted an alternative viewpoint on the situation. It's my life. It's uh, just as much my planet as anyone else's. I can do what I, what I like just as much as anyone else can. Now, two months later, Jonathan's neighbours have had enough and have joined forces and hatched a plan to get the drugs off the estate. When me and John started the petition, um, we now have 179 supporters. I want Jonathan to get rehoused. Um, I don't want to see him on the street and I don't want to see him homeless. Um, but he just cannot be in this, this block of flats if he is intent on running a cannabis cafe. But Jonathan has more than a community petition to worry about. A fortnight after their first visit, the police were back again. The police took a bit of an interest in my cannabis cafe and hotel and decided to charge me with intent to supply a Class B drug, namely cannabis, about a joint's worth. I don't see how they can do that for a joint's worth. That's personal consumption. They had no evidence I intended to sell it to anyone. I certainly didn't. I intended to smoke it all myself. Within days, Jonathan was arrested and released on bail and police told him that he wasn't allowed any visitors to his flat for any reason whatsoever. And while we were filming on the estate... Uh, the police just came to arrest Jonathan, I think. I'm not really sure, obviously, but I think they just did. He might be in one of the meat wagons, I'm not really sure yet. I'm a bit happy in a way, because it might be ending. Oh, his reign of terror might be ending. In South Wales, Anna Ratcliffe had thought she'd found her dream home in a picturesque rural village. I quite often used to sit outside with a cup of tea in the morning and it was lovely. You could see over the fence, across to the other side of the river. In the summer it's beautiful, birds are singing. It's really pretty. 
But after enjoying 10 years of an idyllic life, it was turned upside down when a family moved into the former village pub. My partner was outside and he could see that he was up to something because throughout the day he could see this, this structure coming together and eventually Mr Swain finished the structure, taking him all day, and he placed it there. And he was swearing, that will stop your view of the river. And he was screaming. I could not believe the lunacy of the man. Every time that my partner tried to speak to him or every time he spoke to my neighbours down the road, it'd be, I'm a millionaire, I can do what I want. By now, Anna and her partner had begun taking photos to document their neighbour's behaviour. I used to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what they were up to and why they were doing it, and now I, I can honestly say they just do it because they enjoy it and they think they can get away with it. It's as shallow as that. They're just bullies. But it didn't end there. In June 2013, Mr Swain suddenly began another construction project. And my partner rings me in work, and this time he tells me that Mr Swain has erected a fence, basically fencing our caravans in, but also slicing off some of our land. This is my front garden, my neighbour's front garden, and the off-road access and the Swain's property. Um, this area marked in red is the land that he managed to fence off. Only days after the fence had gone up, Anna discovered what Mr Swain had planned. We are also advised by our client that the caravan has not been moved. We will put you on notice of our client's intention to charge a fee at a rate of £50 a week. As at today's date, this stands at £550. He was basically trying to charge me £550 for me parking my own vehicles, the caravans, on my own land. Not once in any correspondence between my solicitor and their solicitor have they ever offered any uh, proof or any reasoning why they think the land is theirs. The, and they can't because it isn't theirs. Anna's other neighbour, David Jenkins, was receiving a very different form of communication from Mr Swain. I sit for hours on the wall outside, with my hands on the wall, watching the traffic, and every time he's passed, he's gone like that. But you see, he's on the move away from me when he's giving me signals like that. David has lived alone since his new neighbours moved in. I'm not glad my wife had died at all, but I am glad that she's gone before him, before he came here. Because she would not, with the condition she had, she could not have put up with um, any uh, abuse or anything like that. We asked Mr and Mrs Swain for their version of events, but so far they haven't responded. For Anna Radcliffe, the barrage from next door was not yet over. The Swains continued to renovate the former pub, and when Anna saw the planning application, she was stunned. When I found the location plan, it included within his boundary that land which my caravan sits on. Mr Swain has outlined his boundary as including uh, that bit of off-road parking which goes up to my fenced-off area. I wasn't surprised. Um, I was getting a real idea for what these people were like. He was like a dog with a bone. He, wa he, he wanted that land. In the Lincolnshire town of Boston, Steve Foster had only been in his new flat for six weeks when one evening his noisy neighbour, Mr Jackstas, started making threats of violence. He was sort of like, oh, well, I'm going to come up and kill you, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill your dog. But this was just the start of Steve's nightmare. All of a sudden, we heard a bang coming from downstairs. So we ran to the top of the stairs to see what was going on, and we could see um, a silhouette downstairs kicking and banging the door, like trying really hard to get into the house. We couldn't see exactly who he was, apart from the shape of the door. 
After hearing the guy's voice, we realised it was the same guy from out back, and the concern was at the time that he was actually going to get in. As Mr Jackstas tried to kick their door down, Steve and his flatmates sprang into action. At this point, we had to barricade the door because he was making progress trying to, you know, trying to get in. So we had to physically barricade it. And we were using bicycles, anything we could find. At this point, he was still like hammering out the door trying to get in. That's when I called the police. After dialing 999, Steve rushed back to help his flatmate at the door. But an already shocking chain of events suddenly spiralled out of control. We suddenly saw a knife come through the door being waved about with a slashing motion. It was, it was a big carving knife that would have done some damage. He said that he was trying to kill us, that he was going to kill us. And we thought, well, what a psycho. I mean, I hope the police get here as soon as possible because like, if he's going to do that, then he's going to do anything. The situation was critical. And with his five-year-old son asleep upstairs, Steve was taking no chances. I thought, well, if he's going to get in, I'm going to have to defend myself. Um, so I went to the kitchen and I grabbed a knife. It looked like he was going to get in because the door was becoming really loose. Um, then we heard a siren in the distance, and then all of a sudden he just seemed to vanish. Steve went straight upstairs to check on his son. But as he did so, he heard yet more shouting outside. I saw the guy being dragged out from down that alleyway. He wasn't very cooperative at all. He was kicking off, you know, he was resisting arrest quite badly. He was, you know, throwing his arms around, or trying to throw his arms around and, you know, moving his head and, like, kicking and stomping and, you know, shouting and just generally trying to hinder him. He got kited off. Mr Jackstas was arrested and charged with possession of a bladed weapon in public and threatening behaviour. A date was set for trial. But when Steve told his workmates about his run-in with Jack Stas, the biggest shot was yet to come. I found out from the local Lithuanian community in Boston that he'd, he'd been arrested for murder previously. Bloody hell, you know, um, how, how could he be let in, you know, with that sort of thing hanging over his head? The murder was committed when Mr Jack Stas was 16 years old and living in Lithuania. He'd been convicted and sentenced to nine years' imprisonment, but served only six before moving to Britain. To think that he only served, like, quite a short time for murder is quite... I, in my mind, it's quite bad, because in this country, it'd be life sentence. Two months after being arrested for attacking Steve's flat, Raimondas Jackstas appeared at Lincoln Crown Court. He pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to two years in jail. Taking into account his previous conviction, the judge stated, it appears on release from prison, you were able to come into this country without any hindrance, and subsequently live here without any monitoring. Shortly after the incident, Steve moved out of the flat, but the thought of what could have happened that day is chilling. Coming back to the house, I'm still shocked. A convicted murderer was living right below us when I was just up there, and it's really shocking, you know, I'm, it shocks me now, still, that he was allowed in without any checks or anything like that. Coming up, Jonathan's got an appointment at the local police station. No, I'm perfectly calm. I, you know, I don't anticipate any problems. And Anna Radcliffe feels trapped. He's put a big container lorry in his car park. It's on wheels, so it's not illegal. But who's going to take any notice of us? Who's going to, who's going to do anything about that? Nobody. When new residents moved into a tranquil country village in South Wales, village life took an immediate turn for the worse. He's just a nutcase. <laughs> Anna Ratcliffe now feels intimidated by her neighbours, Mr and Mrs Swain. We heard quite a commotion outside on the road, so I looked out the window and I could see a large crane parked opposite the entrance to the shared access. And I knew then that something horrible was going to happen. A huge container lorry arrived and traffic had to be stopped because the crane was trying to hoist this huge container into the air and eventually they managed to swing it over into Mr Swain's property. The 
container was absolutely huge. It was 40 foot long and 20 foot high. And Mr Swain was screaming and shouting as usual and swearing and saying that will stop your view of the river. So as you can see, OK, well, this is um, the kitchen window that I look out of and here, you know, here's the container. It's basically blocking out most of my view. Um, and from the bedrooms upstairs, all you can really see is the top of the container. We didn't bother calling the police. What, what crime can we say he's committing? He's put a big container lorry in his car park. It's on wheels, so it's not illegal. It's not nice to look at, it blocks our light. But who's gonna take any notice of us? Who's gonna, who's gonna do anything about that? Nobody. I wouldn't pick him as a neighbor. He's not the nice man. I wouldn't want my children growing up with somebody like that around. The Swains declined to take part in this program. As for Anna and David, they're at their wits end and feel powerless against their neighbors. Anna Ratcliffe has now installed CCTV cameras. One of his threats was that he was going to make it so miserable for us to live here that we'd want to move it, move, and he could buy the house cheaply off us. I mean, when someone delivers a 40-foot long container um, and dumps it outside your window and threatens you, you think, well, OK, can it get much worse than that? Anna is left wondering what Mr Swain will do next. In Guildford, Jonathan Falcus has opened the doors to his council flat to anyone that wants to freely smoke cannabis. But the police have shown up, sending the neighbourhood into a state of confusion. The police have just um, gone around our local neighbourhood um, giving out leaflets. Should I go over there and ask? Can I please have a leaflet? What's a leaflet? They're closing the property. If you see anyone entering the property, please call 999 immediately. Between now and the 12th of June, 2015, and the owner and tenant can lawfully remain at this property. If you see anyone entering the property, please call 999. He won't care. Jonathan doesn't care at all when the police come. He thinks he likes the attention, I think. The cannabis cafe is now closed. We're good. In June 2015, Jonathan was forced to stop opening his flat to the general public to smoke cannabis but he is still facing a charge of intent to supply a Class B drug. No, I'm perfectly calm. I, you know, I don't anticipate any problems. The outcome was that I've been bailed to appear at Guildford Magistrates on the 16th of July, 10 in the morning, where I'll plead guilty to a uh, charge of intent to supply cannabis. I think Jonathan sees himself as he's a lot better than everyone else and he's above the law. So, yeah, um, he deserves whatever he gets in my books. I don't want to talk to him no more. I think he's uh, a childish prick. So that is now the end of the Cannabis Cafe in Slyfield. I intend to move on to Ventures New. Got the rest of the day to enjoy the sun. In court, Jonathan pleaded guilty to intent to supply a Class B drug. He awaits sentencing. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Have you got a nightmare neighbour story? Get in touch at channel5.com forward slash nightmare neighbour. I'm back next Wednesday at 8 with the nightmare neighbour next door when neighbours attack. Pop in for a visit to the Special Needs Hotel. You'll be very welcomed. Brand new tomorrow at 10 on Channel 5. Next tonight, the house is divided, but it's the royal family task wearing a little thin. We'll soon see in Celebrity Big Brother.